This next situation in this trauma series is going to look at endovascular resuscitation. Um, and what I mean by that is, of course, Reboa. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about the background of what Reboa actually is. Um, it's a term that we've been using quite a fair bit, but I appreciate it might not be familiar to everybody. I'm going to touch on the UK Reboa trial, uh, keeping in mind results that haven't come out yet, but it has been stopped early, which is quite interesting in itself. I want to focus a fair bit on pre-hospital Reboa because I think my personal feeling is that there's there's a future here for this as an intervention uh, and there may be changes coming to uh, the pre-hospital field uh, both in the East Midlands but also nationally so we're going to cover zone three and zone one studies for this. I think it's really important we cover the concept of partial Reboa because that's probably where the future lies with uh, zone one techniques and then finally we're going to look at what this means for us as an anaesthetic department here at NUH um, and again just considering some of the things that we're going to need to think about in the near future if this is something that's going to be coming to us. So first of all what is Reboa? Well it's an acronym it stands for Resuscitative Endovascular Balloon Occlusion of the Aorta and it's a percutaneously inserted balloon uh, that allows you to inflate a balloon up in the aorta and the percutaneous bit is a common femoral artery and that's really important because if you try and insert the eight French vascular access sheath too distally, so you're in the um, superficial femoral artery, then the morbidity associated with the procedure is higher. So we need to be using ultrasound ideally and we need to be percutaneously inserting through the common femoral artery. It's warranted in patients who we think are going to bleed to death before we can get surgical or interventional radiological hemorrhage control. So it's a bridge to hemorrhage control for exsanguinating non-compressible torso hemorrhage. So any bleeding below the diaphragm, okay, that includes abdominal, pelvic, groin, buttock, those junctional bleeds that are difficult to control both in and pre-hospital. It's not just about hemorrhage control though, and this is a really key point that I want to make today. Yes, the balloon will allow you to get hemorrhage control for arterial vascular structures below it, but we need to get the concepts straight in our heads that this is also a resuscitative tool. Okay, It will increase your afterload and aortic root pressure, so you get afterload augmentation, which will improve coronary and cerebral perfusion rapidly. OK, and we'll cover this in a bit more detail later. So let's talk a little bit about anatomy and classification. So the balloon can be deployed into um, three zones, but we tend to only deploy it into one of two zones. So zone one is your thoracic aorta. So the balloon needs to be somewhere between the left subclavian artery and the celiac axis. And if you get that deployment right, that's the zone one occlusion that we've achieved. In an adult male patient, that's approximately 45 centimetre insertion. So that's just a rule of thumb on the catheter at the common femoral artery percutaneous insertion point. If it's reads 45 centimetres, it's probably right in a 70, 80 kilo man. Distal uh, abdominal aortic occlusion, otherwise known as zone three occlusion, is anywhere between the renal artery and the aortic bifurcation. OK, and that's about 30 centimetre um, insertion depth on the catheter itself. So that's as simple as it gets really. That's um, pretty straightforward. Zone 1 or Zone 3. The numbers to remember are 30 and 45. In terms of the kit, so this is the <clears throat> Verboa catheter that's currently being used by uh, the London group, I believe. Um, it's been a while since I've worked there, but uh, a few things to draw your attention to. There are two ports on this catheter, one of which is the balloon inflation port, which we inflate with saline, and the other is a pressure transducer port. So the pressure, pressure transducer will be from the tip of the catheter. Now something which we need to think about if and when we support this intervention in the future <clears throat> is you're going to need two pressure transducers, one through and zero, ready to go. You have one connected to the tip of this catheter and you have the other one connected to the side port of the femoral access sheath. 
because you need to be able to transduce two pressures continuously, one at the tip and one at the femoral access sheath, because the femoral access sheath pressure waveform um, will show you whether or not there's any flow below the balloon. And that's really important. I'll show you why in a bit. So let's talk about the problem. So why, why Reboa? Why do we even need it? Well, non-compressible torso hemorrhage, which is what this is all about really, is a really important cause of preventable trauma death. And we've known this for decades. Now the trauma system, so the major trauma system that when it was implemented, undoubtedly improved time to definitive surgical hemorrhage control for patients with non-compressible tor torso hemorrhage, but it isn't doing enough. So a study from the Royal London Hospital showed that 50% of pelvic fractures and 40% of torso vascular injuries who ultimately died from exsanguination and hypervolemia arrested in ED or soon after arrival in hospital. So that cohort of patients, despite the trauma system and despite having London Air Ambulance and the London Ambulance Service rushing these hot patients to a major trauma centre in very short periods of time, they're still dying despite these trauma systems. So the the degree and the severity of the exsanguination hypervolemia that these patients are getting is unsurvivable based on current interventions that are being used at the time. And ultimately, if somebody arrests in front of you from an arterial exsanguinating source, with sub, uh, where you think that subdiaphragmatically, the only intervention without the bow on the table that we can do to try and arrest that is a resuscitative thoracotomy to get proximal aortic control. Now, don't get me wrong, that is a very effective procedure in patients who have intrathoracic sources of hemorrhage and tamponade. But in patients who have subdiaphragmatic exsanguination, we know that the outcome data for those patients having a thoracotomy is still extremely poor. And we needed a novel intervention to try and salvage these patients. And that's where a BOA comes in. Now, the key to all of this is being able to reliably and accurately select those patients who you think are exsanguinating and will not survive to hospital, surgical or interventional radiological treatment. And that's really difficult because the process of exsanguination, so the process of losing blood to the degree to be sufficient to cause death, is really difficult to recognise. And I've, seen, I've used this slide in a number of my talks before. This is the ATL, ATLS classification of shock states. Um, and it simplifies it, um, it probably oversimplifies it into four classifications. We know that those classifications are unreliable. OK, the heart rate, the blood pressure, the respiratory rate, you know, all of those um, parameters that we're using to measure how shocked patients are, really are um, can't be relied upon accurately. So how do we pick these patients out? Well, there's four things we need to consider. First and foremost, they must have a mechanism of injury that's consistent with causing serious and life-threatening injury itself. The injuries that you find on primary survey, again, have to be consistent with the patient having major bleeding. For example, if you had a significant head injury, but very little else on primary survey, and your patient in front of you has a systolic of 50, it's entirely possible that they're a bleeding mimic from traumatic brain injury. The physiology needs to evolve over appropriate time scale. And what I mean by this is that if your diagnosis is one of an arterial source for exsanguination and it's taken the patient an hour and a half to get to a profoundly hypervolemic shock state, it's more likely they have an alternate, alter, alternate source of bleeding, venous, bony, parenchymal, for example. And you might find that they are a transient or a good responder to volume resuscitation, and it might be appropriate just to hold off from a Reboa or thoracotomy perspective with that in mind. And then finally, we need to actually think about bleeding mimics and the concept of the hate for late. Now, I'm not going to go into those into detail today. I've spoken about them previously, but the take home really for me is that your physical examination of the patient, not the numerical values being given you given to you by the machines that are connected to the patient are most important. So patients who are truly exsanguinating will look or should look like this. So they'll be diaphoretic, sweaty, pale. In blunt polytrauma, you'd expect their venous tone to be very poor and difficult to cannulate. They will not cerebrate appropriately if they're about to die from hypervolemia. 
your end tidal CO2 should be low. If it's high, think about whether or not they've got heart failure from brain injury related um, reflexes. Uh, air hunger, and then finally, heart rate and blood pressure. Now, your heart rate can be low, can be normal, can be high, so it's kind of a bit unreliable and it's variable depending on the type of exsanguination and the injury pattern that they have. And then finally, I put blood pressure in brackets because non-invasive blood pressure is notoriously unreliable for telling us what the patient's volume status looks like. And again, I think we should be getting our invasive arterial access into these patients early. And that's certainly something we're starting to do pre-hospital now. So don't be surprised if a lot of these patients are arriving with common femoral arterial access in being pressure transduced already. And that will help us as a trauma team in hospital to make faster and better decisions. So I think that's a really great step forward for us. OK, so let's look a little bit at the evidence around Reboa. Now, there are a number of uh, large animal models uh, of uncontrolled, non-compressible torsal hemorrhage that do show Rebera to be highly effective. However, in the human cohort, there's very limited evidence and certainly no randomised data out there at the moment supporting the role for Rebera. And this was kind of the, the background and the basis for the UK Rebera trial. Now, we were a recruiting centre for the UK Rebera trial, as were most of the major trauma centres across the UK. And this study aimed to establish the both the clinical and cost effectiveness of Rebera for uncontrolled torso hemorrhage, that bleeding below the diaphragm is what we're talking about. And we were comparing that with standard treatments. That could be, you know, whatever you thought was an appropriate treatment for the patient, be it just volume resuscitation, intervention of radiology, theatre surgical control, or resuscitative thoracotomy in ED or in theatre. The inclusion criteria were adult patients with suspected life-threatening torso hemorrhage that was amenable to Reboa, either zone one or zone three Reboa, depending on where you think the anatomy of the injury is. Now, this is the difficult bit because we're, we will undoubtedly have recruited patients this study who didn't have life-threatening torso hemorrhage or had irreversible torso hemorrhage or had bleeding mimics and that will impact on the data outcome and that's why we um, I suspect why we haven't heard what the outcome of this is yet. The exclusion criteria were women who were thought or known to be pregnant, children, patients with injuries that are deemed to be unsurvivable and thoracic injuries. Now the thoracic injuries was a relative contraindication if you think they had significant bleeding from a thoracic injury, then yes, um, Rebera may not be the right option for that patient. But if you think their thoracic injuries were not a major contributing factor to the examination, then by all means, you can recruit the patient. Again, the problem here with the unsurvivable injury is that that's very clinician um, dependent because if a patient has a head injury with a large scalp laceration who is GCS3 on scene and has fixed pupils, well, actually, that doesn't necessarily mean they have an unsurvivable brain injury. It might be that they're concussed, they had hypoxic episodes, and their pupils are large and unreactive because of the hypoxia and the catecholamine storm that, f that followed from that. So they may, they may resolve with time. We need to get through the CT scanner to really m determine what their you know, neuroprognostication is. Um, but we've got to recruit them before that. So again, this will impact on the data analysis. Now, the study was stopped early. Um, I don't know why. Uh, it's unlikely, I think, that it was stopped early because it was showing that Reboa was undoubtedly the best intervention for these patients. Um, and I wonder, and again, this is just my opinion, I wonder whether or not Reboa as an in-hospital intervention is a, is a bit too late you know, maybe we need to catch these patients earlier. Maybe it's better served as a pre-hospital intervention. And that's what I want to talk about next. So this paper is critical, really. This is published in 2019. It is a zone three pre-hospital Reboa study undertaken by London Hems. What did it show? Well, there were 19 trauma and two non-trauma patients recruited in the study. Now, the two non-trauma were patients with femoral artery blowouts from uh, IVDUs with femoral artery blowouts pre-hospital, 
and the other 19 patients were predominantly blood trauma, polytrauma patients, usually uh, trucks or buses running over femurs, stroke pelvises. Now, the feasibility of the intervention was high because 13 of those trauma patients and two of the non-trauma patients were successfully um, included in the study. So a zone through bow was successfully achieved in those patients and, it, and the outcomes of the data. So it showed a significantly improved systolic and mean arterial pressure. Median difference was 57 to 114, so that's massive, it's more than double. It significantly reduced the incidence of pre-hospital cardiac arrest, and it significantly reduced the incidence of death from exsanguination. However, there was a high incidence of distal arterial thrombus requiring thrombectomy in the intervention group. What's interesting though is that the rate of amputation, lower limb amputation, was pretty comparable between the groups. And keep in mind that most of these patients have just had a bus run over their femur or their pelvis, so that's probably understandable as well. Now, I think we need to be very careful how we interpret this data. It's not a randomised trial. It's not even a big number trial. This is small numbers, case series data, but it definitely shows that the intervention is feasible. And there's signal there, certainly, that it will, the intervention is beneficial for these patients who, based on the clinician's impression pre-hospitally, they thought these patients were going to arrest or die from exsanguination without the intervention. Those are the only ones we're recruiting because the take home from the London experience so far on this intervention pre-hospitally is that it's high risk with a high risk of morbidity. We should only be undertaking a bearer in patients with exsanguinating hemorrhage that is expected to result in cardiac arrest before you can get to hospital. Okay, that's crucial and it's also difficult to predict. The next slide is going to be a video which some of you may have seen me play before, um, but I think it just highlights the complexity around undertaking this intervention pre-hospital. Um, and this is with permission of um, the patient involved in this in this video. Um, who survived um, following a rebel. Emergency ambulance, what is the emergency there, please? It's a cyclist on the ground from over by lorry. She's been shot and she's not good. So you straight to one colony, so it's at the first exit. So let's go for the to go over. We are 30 seconds away, over. What's your age, guys? My name's Simon, I'm a doctor. Can you tell me your name? She's obviously a code red, she's got an unstable pelvic fracture. It's quite possible for the bleeding to lead to a cardiac arrest within a few minutes. I had a dilemma with Victoria. I knew what she needed, but I didn't have those things with me. We would only consider using the power in patients where they're bleeding to death at the scene. Every second does count. Sometimes the devastating side of it is very hidden and actually everything on the outside looks intact. Meanwhile, on the inside, they're catastrophically bleeding. These patients are sometimes referred to patients that talk and die. Tell me your name if you can hear me. Vicky, what we're going to do now is we're going to give you an anaesthetic so that you don't feel any pain anymore. When you're about to give an anaesthetic to someone who's that severely injured, you're conscious that they may not survive this accident and that you know, you're voice might be the sort of last voice they hear. Oh, I know, it's, it's, it's going to take all the pain away, okay? Hi, Sam. So if your cyclist, well, wheels have gone over her pelvis and right femur fracture. Can we have silence now, please? This procedure is inserting a balloon into the aorta to stop the patient bleeding to death. You know that it can go wrong so easily. A millimetre of movement either way and it goes wrong and that might be your only Chunks. Let's go. She's got a um, SATS reading now, she didn't have before. Once the balloon was inflated, there was an immediate change in physiology, which confirmed to us that the balloon was doing what we wanted it to do. You may improve things for the brain and the heart, and you may keep that patient alive, which of course is most important, but you are essentially killing the rest of the body.
because you're starving in her blood and we desperately need to get the balloon down so that she survives beyond that. <laughs> When a lorry, a tipper truck, drives over your pelvis, it's going to break everything. The balloon's been up an hour with good effect, but we need to get it down. It's one thing to survive being run over by a lorry. Um, it's another to have a normal life afterwards. Our goal as surgeons, our goal as trauma doctors is, is not just to save life, but also fix people to restore life and get them back to their normal life that they had before they were injured. So I think our hope that video shows um, the complexity around uh, introducing something such as Ruboa, not just pre-hospital, but in hospital as well. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about logistics of that um, in a couple of slides. But first thing I want to talk about is partial Ruboa. And you heard towards the end of that video, um, both the pre-hospital and surgical teams talking about balloon inflation times and the consequences of having protracted balloon inflation times on ischemia and infarction for structures below uh, the balloon itself. So partial Ruboa is a really important concept. Now we know that the duration of balloon occlusion is directly proportional to uh, ultimate morbidity, and we need to get the balloon down and the sheath out as soon as possible, because we also know that the rate of distal arterial thrombus with that sheath, that eight French sheath inside you, is really high. And it's also why we should only do this in patients who we think of like literally dying, imminently dying from its sanguination. It shouldn't be used in lots of patients who have some shock because of the morbidity associated with it. Now, the principle of partial Ribera is where you'll titrate the volume of the balloon to allow some low volume flow distal, ultimately trying to reduce that ischemia time, but whilst also still maintaining that afterload augmentation that the balloon is providing and balancing that resuscitation of the heart versus reintroduction of flow to the rest of the body is really difficult and very nuanced. And that brings me nicely onto this concept of zone one resuscitation. And again, I'll say this as I said before, I think we need to think of a bow as more than just hemorrhage control. And we can reframe our view of a zone one balloon as also being a resuscitated tool. And I want you to remember this phrase, aggressive hemostasis, nuanced resuscitation. So getting that balloon up in zone one will rapidly get your hemostasis, but it will also allow us to nuance the resuscitation that we deliver to the heart and the brain. Now, we know that a balloon in zone one has a greater impact, a more rapid improvement in afterload augmentations. The graph on the left shows with your zone one balloon, you get a more rapid increase in mean arterial pressure than you do with zone three. And the uh, graph on the right shows that the same can be shown for systolic blood pressure. So we can use that zone one balloon to rapidly augment afterloads. But the problem with that, of course, is your lactate rise um, as a parallel to distal tissue ischemia is much worse with the zone one balloon. But if you look more closely at this graph, you can see with the partial Reboa, so titrating that balloon down early to allow some distal flow, the lactate rise is comparable to that of a zone three balloon. And we know that we can keep a zone three balloon up for about an hour. So if we can transition that zone one balloon down to partial within 20 minutes, then actually maybe that will allow us to utilise zone one Ribera as a resuscitative tool for patients who are imminently dying. And what, I, what I'm suggesting here, if you get to a patient who's bradying down, so they've got broad complexes, they've got transitioning to non-palpable pulses, the heart is profoundly metabolically deranged and we need to immediately and rapidly resuscitate it. We get the balloon up in zone one, we give it volume. You might need to do some chest compressions to support the pump 
you get the patient back into a narrow complex PEA and ideally a ROSC, and then you transition that balloon down to allow partial reboa to minimise that distal ischemia time. And maybe if the physiology of the patient allows and the anatomy of the injury allows, i.e. this is all a pelvic injury, you can then drop down to zone three. That's this concept of aggressive hemostasis and nuanced resuscitation. And this is really the principle behind the PPRO study. So this is a, uh, again, a feasibility study of zone one pre-hospital reboa that's been, it's now closed actually, it's finished. They've recruited the eight patients they needed and whether or not we can transition to partial reboa effectively pre-hospital, because if we can't achieve partial reboa pre-hospitally, then actually a zone one balloon probably isn't survivable. Uh, the results of this are pending, but I, you know, I can assure you that they definitely got partial reboa because they were recruiting this when I was there. So just to demonstrate what this might look like, um, if this is something we start doing in the Midlands, um, these are the two pressure traces that I referred to. The red one is the tip of the catheter and the purple one is the sidearm of your femoral access sheath. And you can see how the tip of the catheter is more damped because it's a long, thin channel. Uh, this patient, uh, or this case in particular had an opening pressure of 40 over 20. So, you know, not a survivable blood pressure for an extended period of time. We have pulsatile trace at the side arm of the femoral access sheath. So the balloon is not in not inflated. We then inflate the balloon. Uh, blood pressure doesn't change much. Uh, and we know from the animal work that it actually takes the heart about 10 minutes or so um, to resuscitate to the point of actually generating an improved cardiac output. OK, so we get the balloon up, we augment the afterload, but in the very, very hypovolemic patients, they need a few minutes for the heart to respond to that. Notice that the distal pulse of child trace is gone, so we've can't, we currently at complete reboa. Um, blood pressure is starting to improve. Uh, we're still at complete, complete reboa because there's no postal trace distally. Just note the mean arterial pressure for P2 is at 30 millimetres of mercury. And we've let a little bit of volume out of the balloon. The mean distal pressure is now 21, so we've improved that by 10 millimetres of mercury. And that's all we need to reinstitute distal flow. We're also starting to see the postal trace as well. OK, so we've gone to we've achieved partial reboa for this pre-hospital case. What does this mean for us in the Midlands? Well, exsanguination, like arterial exsanguination, is really rare. Um, it was 0.003% of all of the uh, London Air Ambulance cases. Now, the patient cohort um, that they have in London is also very different to ours here in the Midlands. Um, and that might mean that actually our caseload is even rarer. But we also do have a larger geographical uh, picture um, with longer transfer times to hospitals. So, you know, maybe there is a cohort of patients that will benefit from this. And we're certainly looking at this actively at the moment about whether or not this is a feasible pre-hospital intervention for us in the Midlands, because some of the international data coming out about this is, is pretty impressive. And this is probably also a good opportunity for me to mention that there are medical indications for this procedure as well. And I'm thinking medical cardiac arrest. And there is some work, I believe, on I think it's in Scandinavia somewhere that I'm going at the moment, looking at Reboa to augment coronary perfusion in cardiac arrest and selective cohorts of patients. And certainly um, East Anglian Air Ambulance are undertaking a SPEAR trial at the moment, which is kind of the first step in a feasibility study to see whether or not they can get femoral arterial access in cardiac arrest as a um, stepping stone towards this intervention in the future. So we'll watch this space. The other problem that we have is that uh, skill fade is massive and there's a huge training burden. Now, this is me and uh, paramedic Mick training to be signed off on the BOA when I was working down south. And we'd have to do some form of simulation training every week to keep our hand in. And it's a big it's a big ask. So if this is something we're going to try and deliver pre hospital, then, you know, we need to consider that. And also as an anaesthetic department, you know, if we're going to be receiving these patients or doing this in hospital, we probably also need to think about how we're going to, who's going to be in charge of the balloon, who the balloon operator is going to be. And that probably needs to be a, dis a distinct team. Um, and that might be the pre hostel team integrating with our team temporarily, or it might be that we need to think about how we reorientate our trauma service or anaesthetic service to be able to support this, depending on what the evidence shows.
Um, our dispatch times are probably too long at the moment for across the Midlands if we're going to get to the truly arterial exsanguinating patients, but there's work in progress on that. Um, but what about the barriers and in hospital intervention? Well, I think we're going to have to wait for the PPRO study. There's certainly an argument for just taking the patient to theatre or IR if they're really sick. But actually, time to theatre, or more importantly, time to surgical hemorrhage control is longer than you think. Um, can studies consistently show this to be over 40 minutes, despite our best efforts and despite having slick systems. So maybe actually zone one hybrid resuscitation, that balloon up in the aorta, transitioning to partial once the heart responds to, to that afterload augmentation and then complete deflation in theatre as a augmentation to surgical control is the way forward. Um, we'll have to wait and see. Final slide. So what does this, a few take homes for us as anaesthetists if we start seeing these patients? Don't be fooled by the patients, they're super sick. The numbers might look okay, but they're not. They're code red patients. And we need to minimize inflation duration and progress to partial reverse as soon as possible. Now that might be us doing that if we go down that model, or it might be a pre team temporarily integrating with our team and staying as balloon operators. And that's certainly how the London model has progressed, where the, the LAA team will go with the patient into VD and then maybe up to theatre until they've got hemorrhage control. You're going to need to go partial with your balloon if you're going to IR or if you're doing a contrast enhanced CT. And actually, you might find that the arterial bleeders don't appear into your delayed venous phase because you've got slower and lower flow distal to the balloon. We need to prepare actively and consciously for hemodynamic instability and deflation. Deflate the balloon stages and think about biochem biochemical management strategies. Give calcium early, um, maybe bicarb, blood, vasopressors, and even hemofiltration to support the patient's physiology as they, as they wash out metabolites from, from distal to the balloon. Get the catheter out as soon as possible and do an angio through the femoral abscess sheath before you take that out because the incidence of uh, distal arterial thrombus is really high. Now that there is work ongoing to get the size of that um, catheter down and therefore the access sheath down, that will improve things. But you know, we spend our whole time giving patients TXA and trying to make them clots. It's not surprising that they get arterial thrombus with this intervention. Uh, list of references I'll make available at the end. Uh, I'm happy to provide those.